everyone and welcome back to another episode of The Reality Is. As always, it's Noor and I'm really excited for you guys to listen to today's episode. I had so much fun talking to Mandy Slutsker about OC and a bunch of non-Bravo stuff in Atlanta, but I wanted to give a trigger warning even though before we discuss it, there is another trigger warning, but just in case, um, I want to give a trigger warning that we do talk about the uh, below deck um, down under episode from this week. We do discuss sexual assault and how Bravo is dealing with it. So I wanted to give you guys a little bit of just a heads up on that. If you look at the description of the episode, you can see the timestamps. So if you want to skip over that, I want to be um, sure that you guys see that and just get your eyes on it before the episode starts. And I also want to note one more thing. I had so much fun talking to Mandy, but we both have daytime jobs, so we had hard outs. And so we had to wrap up our discussion on OC fairly quickly. But one thing I did want to note because we you know the episode that um we watched this week for OC was so good it was so freaking funny um but I want to just note one a couple of things that I didn't get a chance to like talk about so Shannon obviously has this like meltdown and she's really upset and all these things and the thing is that yes we can all laugh about Shannon and how ridiculous she's being and all this stuff but I think we need to raise the concern that all these women have right which is um that For a woman of Shannon's age to be this upset, to be this terrified of this man and what will happen if she's no longer with him. And Mandy and I do get into that, but for her to be this terrified of him is alarming and it's scary. And for this man that she's with, John Jensen, to be the type who's like, you cannot discuss my our personal relationship with any of your friends. That is alarming behavior. That is borderline abusive behavior anytime a man tells you that like you can't even discuss our squabbles with any of your friends um you got to get the hell out that's a giant red red flag um that's a way that uh somebody can keep you trapped in your relationship that's a way that somebody can isolate you into your relationship and away from your friends so it scares me for shannon but there's one moment that vicky kind of says um something which is I think to either Heather or to Emily, which is that, you know, Shannon really wants this to work. And when you guys all talk to her, then she gets confused because she doesn't know whether or not she should be with him. And she gets like all your thoughts in her head. And it makes me so sad because, again, Shannon is in her 50s, right? Like she's a fully grown woman who has lived a big life. But Shannon has really worn her relationship with David oopsies she has really worn her relationship with David as like a as like a personality at this point like I think that she has internalized so much of her divorce and her she might call it a failed marriage but I call it just a marriage that didn't end up working out that wasn't good for you she wears so much of that in her personality that she doesn't trust herself for somebody to say you know you guys tell her all these things and then she doesn't know what to do that's really sad and scary and it makes me sad for Shannon because as wild and wacky as she is I adore this woman I think that she is her own biggest enemy. I think that she is only shooting herself in the foot. But I also think that people like Vicky and Tamara and even John Jensen take advantage of that. I mean, David did for years and years and years. And I just want the best for Shannon. Um, Because even when Shannon's in a good place, she's going to make us laugh, right? So there's that. Okay, so that's it. That's a little precursor for the episode. I'm going to go ahead and kick it off. So I hope you guys enjoy it. Thank you for being here and thank you for listening. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another episode of The Reality Is. As always, it's Noor, and I'm so excited because this guest today is a long time coming and shocking to me that this is her first time on the podcast because I feel like we communicate so often that I feel like I've been on the podcast already, so shame on me for not doing this. But it's Mandy Slutsker, host of Is This Real Life with Mandy Slutsker, and I'm just so excited to have you on today. I'm so happy to be here. You have no idea the things that I've moved around to make this happen. (laughs) Whoa. Okay. No pressure. No pressure. Um, Okay. So I just want to preface by saying that we recognize that the Salt Lake City trailer dropped literally this morning. It's Friday. 
But we are not talking about it right now because there's too much other stuff going on right now. There's a (laughs) lot (laughs) happening. It's all happening. (laughs) It's it's all happening. And frankly, it's too much. There's only so much the two of us can do, especially because we have other jobs. Uh, I know. I was literally in the Senate this morning. (laughs) (laughs) Okay. I was not in Senate, but I did have to write some scathing emails at work. So I'm – you know what? I just don't have time for Salt Lake City today. I know. I know. I'm just – I can't keep up. It's like, do I – can I watch it, you know, in between meetings? Can I – you know, it's – (laughs) there's – Ah, and in between everything. So I was like going to meetings in the Senate. They're on recess, but like I, whatever, it's like a time that you can meet with staffers. And then um, my dog's been like peeing in the middle of the night. And so oh. the vet wanted a sample of her urine. So I'm like trying to grab a sample in the middle of the day and like run to the vet <laughs> so they can like run it before I go out of town tomorrow. <laughs> oh my God. Yeah. No. Mm-mm. No, Salt Lake City, you're just going to have to wait, okay? And also, it's fine because as Bravo accounts and Bravo fans do, people will not shut up about it until it premieres. So you're fine. It's okay. I know. I know. All right. I will watch but, eventually. Yes, exactly. Uh, but today we are going to talk about Atlanta OC and we are going to discuss Below Deck. So I don't usually talk about Below Deck on the podcast. I'm not a Below Deck girl. Um, but I did watch Below Deck Down Under this week. Um, I don't know if it was this week or last week because I watched it on Peacock and it was two episodes. But my understanding is that they did like a, a two-parter or two hours. And so I think because on the podcast we talk about problematic things on reality TV. And we've talked so much about, especially recently, how Bravo is in the news about how they handle um, – their talent and everything like that. I think that it'll be an interesting discussion. I'd love to hear your thoughts on that because I know you haven't really even watched the show either, but it's all over the internet. So we'll get to that as well. Um, But before we do any of that, you are a first time guest. And as we always do, I have to ask you, Mandy, who is your problematic favorite? So I have three and I couldn't decide between them. That's fine. Okay. So the first is Erin Leachy. I love her. Love her. And, um, you know, we, we've heard that she may have donated to the Stop the Steal campaign post <laughs> uh, November 2020 election. She claims there is a reason for that. I'm going to believe there's a reason for that. Okay. Um, maybe she lost a bet. <laughs> <laughs> maybe it was not a subscription and she forgot to turn it off. Yeah. Who knows? Who knows? You know, I'm sure there was a reason for it. Um, No, I just find her so delightful and intriguing and I enjoy watching every second she's on TV. I don't know. It's something about her mannerisms and how she talks that kind of lure me in. And then I've got two Vanderpump Rules problematic faves. Stassi found her incredibly funny. I mean, I named my white little bitch dog, uh, Stassi. <laughs> hey, if the shoe fits, it's fine. <laughs> uh, yeah, she's just, you know, I can't get enough of like how she was on the show. I just mm-hmm. found her confessionals to be so, so funny along with James Kennedy. And I would say he's probably my number one problem. Yeah. I can't get enough James Kennedy. I find him so hilarious. Even when he's mean, I laugh. I feel I terrible about it. I know he body shames people. He would probably say horrible things about me if I met him, <laughs> but I find him hilarious. Oh, those are su- that's such a good list, man. Such a, I know I really thought about it. Oh I was like, God. who's yes. like truly problematic? And uh, I don't think Stassi's as problematic. I think she was problematic, and I think she's yeah. kind of like really removed herself. She's not like a vine to get back on the show or anything like that. She's sort of rebranded as a mommy blogger. You know, sure. wish her the best. Yeah. Um, but the things that came out at the reunion about James Kennedy were pretty bad, and everyone glossed over them because of the scandal of it all. But yes. if he is getting inebriated and grabbing waitresses' butts, that is sexual assault. Yes. And that is a problem. Yes. Yes. And he says terrible things to women, especially like. He's he's so mean. He's awful. But he's so funny. I it's know. Like, 
he, when he shouted, I don't even know what season it was. He was like, pump titty. Oh and, <laughs> and when he did an impression of Britney, he's like, why? <laughs> like when, <laughs> when, yes. when Jax cheated on her, like it's just, I, I can't look away. And I also like audibly laugh and few people make me <laughs> laugh out loud truly while I'm like alone with my dog watching these shows. And James <laughs> Kennedy is one of them. <laughs> My favorite thing that he said at the reunion was when he, when Lisa was like, oh, you know, Tom Sandoval, he got distracted because she's a beauty queen, a pageant queen. And he just kind of passively goes, she doesn't she win those win. either, Lisa. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he's like, she ain't winning those either, Lisa. Oh, he is too good, too good. <laughs> oh, God. Okay. We, so we also, thank you for sharing that. Those are great. Um. We, like I said, we have some shows to cover, but before we get into that, you like to talk about politics. I like to talk about politics. And recently we had a Bravo pol- politics crossover that that a lot of people are shocked by, but I saw what you posted online and I think that it's really worth it. So uh, Carol was on Heather McDonald's podcast and she <laughs> said that uh, allegedly the picture that Bethany shared to the group and Luann of Tom kissing another woman at the Regency was taken by none other than Michael Cohen. <laughs> yes. And I was not shocked by this <laughs> because everyone, everyone seems to forget that Michael Cohen and Dennis were best childhood friends and I they stayed best this. friends. Yes. This was like huge for me and everyone ignored it. No one paid attention. It was like <laughs> the pandemic was happening. I, whatever else was going so on, like things, there yes. were so many things. And I was like, guys, like this is crazy. And when Michael Cohen flipped, it was within weeks of Dennis dying. Wow. And Dennis had kids that were around the same age as Mike, Michael Cohen's kids. And I have a feeling his life flashed before his eyes. And he thought, if I end up in prison for a long time away from my children, you know, to cover for Donald Trump. Like, I'm not willing to do that. I'm going to come clean and I'm going to have a like reduced sentence and I'll work with, you know, the feds. And that's my theory. I'm sticking to it. I have had it for years. I've been saying that I think that Dennis's death impacted Michael Cohen flipping. And again, all roads lead to Bravo. All so. roads lead to Bravo. I mean, it's – and then, like, you know, if you think about, like, if you think about it separately from, obviously, the political side of things, because this – say it's not about Tom, whatever, all that. When did that happen? That happened in, what, 2015 or 2014? Like, when did Luann have that so bachelorette trip? It was in, I think, 2016 because oh. – So Luann's niece, I know one of her nieces, she has a lot of um, nieces and nephews. And one of them I know because we, she dated my best friend. Um, Yeah, for a couple years. And then we, her and I stayed friendly and we used to go to yoga together. And I remember both of us had weddings on New Year's Eve that year. Um, (gasps) And hers was her Aunt Luann. (laughs) And so I was like, what happened? And she was like, oh, my God, everyone was doing shots. Dorinda was crazy. Jill Zarin is hilarious. Like um, Luann jumped out of a cake or someone jumped out of a cake (laughs) at the wedding and did like a Marilyn Monroe thing. It was nuts. It was absolutely insane. And then, so that was 2016. So I'm assuming that the um, pre-wedding was like happening and filmed in 2016. Yeah. Okay. So then, yeah, if we, if we take about, think about it aside from the election and all that stuff that was also happening that year, um, it makes sense that like, well, the Dennis and Michael Cohen childhood friend connection is one thing, but like Donald Trump is at the end of the day, a reality television star. He was just a pop culture person before he decided to do whatever he did to our government. So, like, I I think that there's it, – it, like, makes sense. I mean, NeNe Leakes was getting Trump checks, you know? So, like, I don't know. It's just uh, all roads lead to Bravo. And reality TV stars, they stick together. They're friends. <laughs> It's just, it's too much. But yeah, I think I read in some of the articles about Dennis's death that like Michael Cohen was one of the first people at the scene. Um, wow. Yeah. So he lived like a few blocks away and yeah. 
Oh, wow. All right. Well, um, thanks, Michael Cohen, for bringing that to our lives. And also for flipping. <laughs> <laughs> and for letting us know about Tom. <laughs> yes. Thanks. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> uh, Just the idea right. that Michael Cohen, like, knows about the real housewives of New York City is – it's so funny to me. I know, but I think it's also because like I guess for me that's not always as shocking because I'm like they were all hobnobbing in the same circles like you know before they had cameras on them. Like you know, I feel like Dorinda was probably around these people all the time before yeah. she was on the show. So it's like I, I don't know. I just I find it shocking but it's also like I feel like New York City like not that it's the same circle certainly is not, but like even like the the way that I've heard it from like my modern Orthodox Jewish friends, like everybody mm-hmm. in the city knows everybody, Muslim friends, everybody in the city knows everybody. Like I'm not surprised at this like particular type of like wealthy, rich white people. Like yes. they and they're all around the same age. So I feel like that sort of tracks also. Um Yeah, Michael know, Cohen, now- not the best representation of the Jews. No. <laughs> no. no. <laughs> Listen, we all have our people that we wish were not really our people, but we oh, have no time. yeah. Um, also, I'm thinking about like how Luann like came for Dennis like so hard. Remember that season when Luann was like really coming for Dennis and like his kids and all? I'm just like, I don't know. Maybe Luann was pissed about the Tom thing. I don't know. Like I'm just uh, – now, oh, now I'm so like – so interesting. <laughs> I didn't even think about that. Because Luann claimed that – Dennis's daughters are friends with like Luann's nieces because she has a million nieces. <laughs> I also like going to like the Bethany of it all and her, um, you know, what she's alleging about Bravo and NBC. Mm-hmm. Sometimes I think she's putting too much onus on Bravo and NBC mm-hmm. in production mm-hmm. for the well being of people when you can't always control their well being. And in a great example of that is Dennis, unfortunately. Yeah. Mm-hmm. She was potentially engaged to this man. She was dating him very seriously. He had an opioid addiction and he died from an opioid overdose that she could not prevent because. Yeah. Addiction is a very complicated and serious disease, yep. and so are many of the mental health issues that some of the, um, you know, talent on Bravo deal with. And I don't know that Bravo should necessarily be responsible. I mean, I think they need to obviously create a good environment, and I don't know the seriousness of some of the allegations. So, like, you know, my mind is very open on that. But just it's it's complicated. The well-being of reality TV and the well-being of people, are it's very complicated. Yeah, I think that's a great segue into talking about this uh, Below Deck Down Under episode that aired um, this week. So, If uh, First of all, I just want to say trigger warning. We are going to be talking about sexual assault. If you are uncomfortable with hearing us talk about it, certainly feel free to skip past it. We'll dive into OC after that. And maybe I'll put in a little commercial break after we end our Below Deck talk, and then you can join us after. Okay. So this week on Below Deck, Down Under, um, there was a really harrowing um, scene that I'm – glad bravo showed um it was a uh the bosun named luke he was fully naked got into the bed of one of the um deck crew this woman named margo while she was completely blackout drunk and asleep um it happened while the lights went out for just a second in the boat there was like a power outage he got in fully naked And before the cameras actually, before he sees the cameras on him, he is getting ready to mount on top of this woman. And then he sees a camera and kind of lays to the side. So his back is to the camera. Um, He's in the top bunk and production went in and said, nope, you got to get out. We got to get you out of here. You cannot be in there. You cannot be in here. Production camera crew immediately went in, got this guy out, pushed him out. Um, Aisha, who is the chief stew on, immediately went to the captain of the boat, Jason, and said, here's what's happened. Jason said, uh, and, and that Luke has now locked himself into his room. Jason said, absolutely not. He opened the door. He got Luke out. He told him, go stay at a hotel tonight and tomorrow you're getting your things and you're going, I'm going to terminate your time on the boat. That's it. Um, 
And also another thing that happened is that there was a woman named Laura who is also being extremely um, touchy-feely and inappropriate with another deck person named Adam. He's uh, multiple times told her, I'm not interested. He's declined her advances. And again, the production crew has to tell her, get out of his bunk. He is trying to sleep. You are climbing on top of him. You need to get out. And the next day, Laura tells Margot all kinds of things that like, I always say this, if you follow me on Twitter, misogyny is a hell of a drug and women are sometimes the greatest abusers of it. And it's such a shame. But Laura the next day tells Margot that if he came, if Luke came into my room naked, I would have made him happy. And he was just being playful. He's a sexual person. You shouldn't take it so seriously. I feel like he should have gotten a warning. This isn't fair. I feel sad for him, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. While this woman, Margot, is kind of feeling shitty about herself. She's horrified. She's scared. She's blaming herself a lot by saying, I drank too much. I drank too much. Um, and and all this happens. And Jason, again, the captain says, uh, yeah, we're not doing this. You're getting off the boat too, Laura. And he fires Laura off. So I was thinking a lot about what of, about like what went right here. And it's like, you know, we talk a lot about like reality TV and like what is the purpose of it and what are we getting out of it and people like to knock it a lot and say like oh it's just you're just watching people fight like whatever like you're just watching women fight and like whatever I always say it is it's like a sociology experiment it's like a great insight into like you know uh, certainly these are exaggerated caricatures of what adult female friendships look like or what marriage looks like. But a lot of times I watch it and I take like lessons out of it for myself. Like I always, it reminds you of a situation you've been in or teaches you how to deal with things. And I think that this episode of Below Deck Down Under, it was like the the examples of incredible leadership were like Asia and Jason who like didn't, Asia from the beginning was like something feels wrong and I'm not leaving Margot's side and I feel really uncomfortable about the way that Luke is looking at her and I don't like it. And she's really drunk and it doesn't feel safe. And the only reason Luke got into her, Margot's room is because Asia walked away for a second to get food. And so she – and then she immediately jumps in and is like, this is wrong. She immediately tells Jason. Jason says, this is wrong. And they get this guy off the boat. Like there's no discussion. There's no argue. Like there's no debating. There's no what about his well-being. And like they're down a bosun. They're down a stew. Their charter is going to be harder. It is going to be more difficult for them to do their job. But Jason said, fuck it. The ch- It's not the safety of my – my staff is more important than a potential tip that we could get or making these charter guests happy. And I think that it's such a refreshing change from below deck seasons in the past because I've always had issue with like how creepy the charter guests are on below deck. I feel like below deck has like very problematic shit because it's almost like every season people feel obligated to hook up with each other. And I was just really impressed by the change because I'm worried that if it was a different captain or a different stew, production can only do so much. Production says, get out of the room. But everything that happens afterwards about getting Luke off the boat or getting Laura off the boat, that is up to the people who are cast on this reality show. And when I think about that in context of what Bravo is being potentially sued for, because it wasn't a lawsuit. It was like a threat of a lawsuit about not keeping their staff safe or whatever – I don't know, like, what are your thoughts about, like, where does Bravo step in and where is it people's responsibility? Like, because reality TV has to show real people reacting in the way that they are really supposed to react. You know, like, I mean, I don't know. What are your thoughts about that? Because I feel like it is a little bit gray of, like, who steps in here, you know? I guess I feel like these shows reflect reality. Right. And in this case, it was the reality. Um, it was it was a, a better outcome. Right. And I feel like sorry, my, my thoughts are kind of all over the place. Sure, Yeah, of course. Take your time. So I feel like 
sometimes when we don't like how things go on the show, we don't like how people, what they say and all that, that these are reactions that we don't like in our real lives, right? These mm-hmm. are real reactions when people say something that's sexist or racist or anti-Semitic or Islamophobic, like that people are, and sometimes they don't mean it. And, you know, it, it's just, we hear things we don't want and we see things we don't want. And sometimes we don't like the reflections of like what real life is. Mm-hmm. And I think with this situation, we saw the reality of how someone who's predatory can take advantage of a situation such as when the, you know, the power went out and that's when he decided to kind of go for it. And, I don't know what the responsibility of everyone is, but I think production did the right thing by stepping in in the moment, by stepping in and preventing any assault from happening. I don't think they can like guarantee what the captain would do. Mm -hmm. And, but at the same time, there's also probably rules about both being a, someone who's working on a boat. There's like the boat rules and then there's the production rules. And Mm -hmm. so I would hope that there were rules within production that if one of the talent um, tries to commit a crime, right, that you would um, remove them. Mm -hmm. So I am just really, really grateful that everyone stepped in that was supposed to step in and that people could actually witness what assault looks like because I think it's in popular culture, a lot of times rape is shown as like a very violent and Mm -hmm. um, scary act. But Mm -hmm. in reality, a lot of times rape is something that happens when one person is not fully conscious and doesn't fully remember and it doesn't look as scary. It's someone kind of benignly climbing into a bed. And, you know, and and this was, I think, all women watching knew like, oh, God, we know what he's trying to do here. And he can play it off as like, we were both drunk. We were both drunk. But then as soon as they yelled at him and production made him get out, he sobered up real quick. Mm Mm-hmm. So yeah. it was it was like we were watching a predator in action. And then when it comes to Laura, that's her name, right? Yeah. That was also a really important lesson because we forget that these people are coworkers and everyone in the workplace is, you know, should be free from assault. Not that friends shouldn't assault each like should it's okay for them to yeah. assault each <laughs> yeah. other. Right. But but in a workplace, there are certain standards and there are regulations. And I don't know what the regulations are when you're on international waters. I don't know if they're Australian, New Zealand, whatever. But, um, you know, you can't just go after someone and make advances and then say no multiple times and like that be okay. That's not okay. That also is sexual assault. And so I'm glad they showed both. And that I think a lot of viewers can like thought Laura was let go because she was making excuses for Luke. But I think she was let go because she was sexually harassing another employee. And then on top of that, Jason gave them a whole talk about boundaries. And then she immediately, like, after that talk, said a bunch of crap to Margo that was not in line with what, you know, the captain had said. So, yeah, I think it all – um, was handled really well. I know there was not a trigger warning on the episode, and that was yes. difficult for some people. Yes. Um, and so hopefully they learn for the future and say, hey, we're, you know, some difficult topics are being discussed that relate to sexual assault. Um, so if that's triggering for you, don't watch this episode. But I think it showed, it was like a perfect lesson in how I almost like feel like this should be shown in like health class when they're talking about consent and like, hey, you have to actually establish consent um, and remind – like a lot of people I think weren't ever taught taught what it meant. I don't think growing up I really was taught that much what it meant. Um, I didn't know that you could revoke it at any time. Mm -hmm. You know, things like that. So if you decide to change your mind while you're having sex, you can stop sex. If you change your mind while you're having sex with your husband, you can change your mind. Like it doesn't matter if you're married. Mm-hmm. It's still assault. And so people need to, I think, like all relearn, right? And um, I think this was a learning experience for a lot of people. And it broke my heart to hear Margot talk to her mom and her sister. And I'm so glad that she was able to talk to them and that they were able to reassure her that like you did nothing wrong. 
and it's shitty that this happened, but you should be able to go out and have fun. And that's exactly what Aisha was saying. She's like, you should be able to go out, get drunk, have fun, and, um, you know, not be assaulted. Yeah, yeah. I, I loved what Zarina said. Zarina, the chef, said women should be able to stand absolutely naked in the middle of a room and not have anything happen to them. There's absolutely no reason why anybody thinks that you should have access to somebody's body. Like, yeah, Asia men, also, like yeah, men hang out naked on the street. Like, yeah. I've seen naked men on my street before. <laughs> like, yeah. they pee. If they're drunk, they decide to like pull over and pee. And you're like, are you kidding me? You yeah. literally just whipped out your dick. You can't yeah. go into a bathroom in one of the rest like hundred restaurants that we have here. Yeah. Yeah. And, and they never um, worry. Yeah, they never worry. Um, and I think what you brought up about consent is so important because Aisha actually specifically kept saying, did you consent to that? Did you consent to him being in your room? Are you consenting to that? Like she kept mm -hmm. saying it because I do think it's so important to like – you really start to normalize the use of that word. Like we in my house, you know, I've got two little boys and we're really big on like if a relative comes over, you don't have to hug them. You can just say hello. You can be polite. You can use your words, but you don't have to hug a person if you don't want to. And even yeah. with my, my kids with each other, you know, my kids like – my little one loves to cuddle and he loves to be in his brother's personal space. But it's so cute to hear them fight with each other also and be like, Noah, you're in my personal space. I need space from you right now. And then Noah will be like, okay, I am giving you space. And Adam will be like, no, but that's your space because you're little. But my space is bigger because I'm older than you. <laughs> like it's so cute. But it's important, right? Because yeah. – I did not like you. It was just not something you grew up in the 80s and 90s. Like you did not grow up hearing stuff like that. And it is important to like normalize it because this is what we mean by keeping women safe, keeping all people safe. Like, and I think that when you bring up the thing about like Bravo and what Bravo could do, it's unfortunate because then I saw the trailer for the rest of the season and the person that is coming to replace Luke is this guy named Joao who was oh, on the low deck. Oh, yeah. Men. I remember him. He called Aisha trash because she liked to dance and like party. He called her like a trashy woman. He called Hannah, the previous uh, chief stew, a thunder C word. And so like allegedly it was because he used to drink a lot and now he's sober and all that stuff. But like I don't know if being sober makes you not an asshole because I still believe that he's an asshole. So like I'm not sure why they would replace him with that person. And then the rest of the season – they're really digging to like um, how Margot might have like a drinking problem. And I think one of the things that makes me worry here is to bring it back to this thing about how Bravo takes care of their talent is obviously she went through this really traumatic experience at work and she may be turning to alcohol as a sort of a band aid because she's in this like high stress environment where she needs to be like back at work and her work is the same place where she sleeps and where she sleeps is the same place where this assault happened. And like, it's a very traumatic experience to be trapped in a boat for six weeks to have to relive what has happened to you. Right. Mm -hmm. So she might be turning to alcohol and I worry like, yes, thank you production for stepping in. Thank you, Jason, for firing this person. But like, did they get a support person for her? Like, did they get her, did they pull her aside and say like, do you want to talk to somebody? Do you want to like, and it's a lot to rely on her coworkers. Like Asia can only do so much and Jason can only do so much. But when it comes to like your actual mental health after you go through something traumatic like that, what are the steps that as a production team you're taking to get somebody mentally well? And I don't know if that varies based on like location and what mm -hmm. various rules are in yeah. different locations for the workplace. But I know that – for like Vanderpump Rules, for example, they offer a psychologist um, okay. or a counselor, mental health person to talk to and people have used that, but it is someone that's provided by production. And so sometimes they don't always, you know, trust. And I'm yes. sure if they were to share something very private um, or about potential self-harm or harm of others that, you know, that person may have to mandatorily report that, um, yeah. you know, and then they may lose their job and this is what they do to make money. And it's, it's yeah. very complicated with the yeah. drinking thing though, you know, not at all to blame Margot, but, um, I find that there's 
I think a lot of like problems with certain professions, one of them being people who work on yachts yeah, and there's like a drinking yeah. cult. Yes. The hospitality business has um, a lot of substance abuse. It's not just mm-hmm. that business. I mean, lawyers have yeah, yeah, to, to get your law degree, you have to go through like an alcoholics class. Like there's a, a lot of issues, yeah. but it, it like encourages it and sort of normalizes binge drinking and that always worries me because I'm like, we all think this is normal behavior for going out and having fun, but it's actually, it's not really. Yeah, It's outside of sort of the boundaries of what's considered quote unquote normal relationship with substances. Yes, absolutely. Um, Well, let's uh, take a quick break and then when we're back, we'll talk about Atlanta and OC. Okay, we're back. (laughs) <laughs> Did you love that break, Mandy? Yes. Thank you so much. <laughs> I was able to like, you know, check some email. <laughs> Clear my head. <laughs> All right. Let's talk about Atlanta first quickly because OC was the queen of the week for me. OC was fantastic. Okay. <laughs> OC was so good. When I was on your podcast, we talked so much about OC because OC is so good. But let's talk about Atlanta briefly because Atlanta has not been anybody's favorite this season. You mentioned it on your podcast about like how it just seems like they don't want to have fun. They don't want to have fun with each other. So why do I want to watch you Mm -hmm. hate each other? Like this isn't enjoyable. But I wanted to ask you, Cynthia was back this season as a friend of. And did you feel that adding Cynthia back in changed any of the vibes that you got this episode? I did feel like a lightness with Mm -hmm. Cynthia. I really like her. I feel like we need to balance some of the like Marlowe behavior Mm -hmm. with other types of personalities. And I mean, I hate to say it, but like, I think Marlo worked better as a friend of, I think as a main cast member, she is too dark and she goes too hard after people. And she also like produces more and it's because she doesn't have the experience of producing. It comes across very obvious um, to everyone, including the viewers. Like I can't always tell when certain housewives are producing, but with her, it's like, oh God please. Yeah. You like came yeah. in with an agenda. So I loved Cynthia. I liked seeing LaToya again. I like having people come in and out, but I do feel like in order for this cast to move forward, Marlo can't be the main. She's just too, she went too hard after Kenya and she went too hard after Candy. Like she went below the belt. Yeah. And she's go. and it's so funny for her to then get so annoyed with Drew because Like, yes, Drew is probably lying um, about quite a few things. It was interesting to see that reveal at the end of the episode where Candy is like, oh, if you didn't kiss her, then I guess I'm wrong. Um, I was like, wow, that's good editing. Bravo. You really kept us there till the end of the episode. But I think that it's like it almost an imbalanced. I don't know. It's weird. It's like. Marlo and Drew fighting with each other feels not fun to me always because it removes the other women from the group a little bit. Like now we're just focused on Marlo and Drew fighting and neither Marlo nor Drew are like beloved enough by either of the parties that they belong to to have anybody tagging in, you know, in like a way that matters. Like I almost feel like Kenya and Candy are like, Drew, why are you bothering with Marlo? Like she's a fucking liar. Like who cares? Or even like Marlo has Sheree and Courtney and Sonia, and they're even like, this is like not worth it for us to be backing you. So you don't necessarily have like two teams. You just have this like kind of annoying squabble that nobody is that interested in like continuing. I don't know. What are your thoughts? I agree with you, but I also find Drew going up against Candy interesting. Yes. That is the – and Drew, I'm telling you, is inherently watchable. I can't take my eyes off her when she is on. I want to know everything about what's going on in her marriage. I want her to finally unveil what has been happening because – Yeah, she's been lying, but she's been lying to try and protect her family and herself and her reputation and her husband's reputation. So I understand. And if you get in the habit of lying to cover for someone all the time, it makes it a lot easier to lie about everything else. I do have a theory, and I've heard this elsewhere, um, but my initial inclination for why Drew was saying, oh, no, I never kissed LaToya, I think is religious. She, you know talked to her mom is a minister or something like that. And she had all these priests and 
whoever I don't really understand um profit her lot or whatever profit that was. that was a profits not priest it was like something I had never heard someone say um which <laughs> but apparently like this is a thing in like certain churches so yeah. I mm-hmm. you know I learned something new but I do think that there may be like an element of of shame there yes um, I agree mm-hmm. uh but it also could be she's afraid of what Ralph might say and how he might use this against her if they ever do get divorced because it's clear that she's been thinking about not staying with him about how do we make this move forward because he stopped doing couples counseling. Yes. That was a big reveal. That was shocking to me. Yeah. And even like um, it was was also strange because before Ralph and before she went to Portugal, they had that like dinner or brunch or whatever at um, Drew's house. And it seemed like Ralph and Drew were fine there. And then she goes to Portugal. He goes to Vegas to try out for Chocolate City. And I don't know what happened with that tryout, but it's she comes back and she's like, yeah, I just like don't really trust him anymore. And I'm like, we're going to need to unpack this a little bit more because it's a little bit of a jump, not a jump that like I don't uh, agree with. Like, yes, you should not trust Ralph. You should have stopped trusting him when he went to Tampa and didn't tell you where he was. And was stalking you with the cameras in the house. <laughs> so what I think this is, is whenever she's being honest and talking to us about how she doesn't trust him, those are in confessionals. And I wonder if those were taped post their separation. Yes. So yeah. it's a lot easier because we're not hearing her in real time say any of this to any of the other women. You're right. Mm-hmm. So I mm-hmm. do think it was – It's post- she's she's not as good at like putting herself back where at how she felt like six months before. She's not as good at, at that, I've noticed. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, you're absolutely right. Um, also, Marlo has this like moment at the end with Ralph at the party at the candy bedroom candy party where she's like talking shit about Drew to Ralph, and Ralph is like laughing. And I was like, I, I, if I saw that, like if if I talked shit about somebody and went up to their husband and said the shit that I was sh- saying about them, and their husband didn't defend them, I would turn around and tell the person I was talking shit about that they need to leave their husband because like that's fucked up like I can't believe that he just like kikied with her and like and like just it was fun I was just like I don't under because Ralph here's Ralph laughing about Marlo making fun of Drew meanwhile he's always like oh I, I need to be respected and Drew doesn't respect me all this I'm like what is this you don't respect her. You let yeah. someone say like, oh, you don't know what kind of person you're going to wake up to each day, which I felt was like very misogynistic. I feel like Marlo has so much like internalized misogyny. Oh, yeah. She just wants to be liked by men. She wants yes. to be like accepted. Yes, absolutely. Um, would you buy anything from the bedroom candy um, line of products? <laughs> Maybe, but some of them scare me, like the swing. Like the that swing feels is terrifying to that me. That feels like you could like rip a tendon or something, yeah. you know? Like it would like pull your legs like too far. Like I'm not Kyle Richards. I can't yes. Yes. do the full splits and it feels like so the swing, maybe no, but the vibrators sound amazing and I bet she would have like other good stuff. Yes, I would definitely get some products from her, but not the swing because the swing. like I- <laughs> it just I was like, oh God. <laughs> the swing just seems like it's a hazard waiting to happen. Like I I would need if I'm gonna do the swing, then I need a, a life alert because I, I, can't, <laughs> alert. <laughs> I can't do both. I can't do you both. You know, I feel like some things sound like they would be sexy, but then when you actually do them, like you can't stop laughing and it's not sexy at all. And that swing definitely falls. I think I think having sex in the shower also, like someone slips, someone hits Always. something. It's as sexy as you think it's going to be. And I feel like the swing, it's maybe only candy, like <laughs> finds it sexy. But like, I think most people would just laugh. Exactly. Exactly. Like, how do I fit into this? I can't, I can't get out of it. Like <laughs> that would be me. I'd be like, I don't know how to take my legs out of this like contraption. <laughs> I'm like forever stuck to my door. Cause you have to like, like, harness it, it to like tether it, it to yeah. something yeah so like what if yeah. someone opens the door like <laughs> yeah. you're just like hanging off the door <laughs> me being in that swing you just imagine shannon bedore being in that swing like that is how goofy i would be and and coordinated and i would not know what to do and i would get trapped and it would be awful um, i can watch shannon bedore do anything 
Well, this is a great segue into this week's OC, which was one of the best episodes of OC that in a few years. I feel like this year OC has been really good. Um, and last few years OC was just really, really sad and annoying to watch. But this episode, this thing that they did where everybody dresses like each other, I hope that they take this and do this across all franchises. I would love every franchise to have a party like this where they dress up like another person from their cast. It was so hilarious. Who did you think did the best job of dressing up as another person? So I laughed the hardest at Jen being Taylor with the cat meme. Yes. <laughs> but I think Emily did the best job of like encapsulating <laughs> Shannon. And I think <laughs> Shannon did the best job on looks for Gina. Yes. And Every Tamara time, did a really yeah. good job with the makeup for the cheekbones for Heather. But this whole like slutty thing, it's like that's yeah. not who she is. Why can't you just act like her? Why can't you just act snotty? Yeah, absolutely. I agree. And I felt like Heather, I love you, but like Heather really was – I feel like Heather up until the day of the party was like, oh, we're really dressing up as, as each other? Like is that not optional? Like I feel like Heather just threw on whatever she could find and was like, yeah, sure, yoga pants and this like – dirty blonde wig when uh who what's was her she name again jen double n jen <laughs> oh who was tamra now i'm forgetting who tamra. tamra was heather i know but who was tamra oh who was tamra oh that's it it was taylor taylor really half-assed it taylor came in as herself okay. with some dumbbells and she was like all right i guess i'm 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 uh tamra now um so we liked seeing cynthia in atlanta did you like seeing vicky here yeah, I really yeah. like – I'm like, oh, why did I ever dislike her? I think her as a friend of is perfect because yeah. she doesn't get wrapped up in like the OG of the OC as much. She can just have fun. She doesn't have to be in the middle of everything. She's a good support system for Shannon. I think she has been a very good friend to Shannon, and I think she empath empathizes with Shannon because she has been Shannon. Yes. In the last for the last 10 years of her relationships she's yes. been with shitty guys and she was trying to make it work and try and prove to everyone that they weren't shitty yes absolutely so shannon sweet sweet baby shannon storms door just like you know that i don't know if you watch euphoria but there's that meme of like there's a meme of oh yes euphoria saying, i've never, I been, never been happier been in my yes life. that is shannon every single year and it is so good this woman runs around saying i'm not crazy <laughs> she I runs mean, around saying i'm not crazy like, you're not gonna make me look crazy <laughs> and what was it un unstable or she like used these words that i was like this is exactly how you come across all the time <laughs> i i am worried though like i think it's really worrisome for someone to be in a relationship and then be afraid of their partner finding something out, like the fear that she has, like this is going to be, it's going to be over. Like, okay, then let it be over. Why would you want to hold on to something that can fall apart that easily? Yes. I You're on a reality show. He has been with you on this reality show. He's not that private. Yes. And you were a reality TV star before you got into a relationship with him. So he knew what he was getting himself yes. into. So, no I reasonable man who wants to have a private life would date a reality star. Like they yeah. wouldn't do that. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So Shannon, Shannon's having an outburst about obviously her own insecurity with her own relationship being aired on TV. That is one thing. But the rest of the girls are sort of fighting about other stuff. And I think it is so funny because I don't think everybody's all on the same page. And I try to sort of like figure it out myself, but Heather is – okay, Gina and Emily – are upset mostly, I think, about the fact that they share their relationship and all their dark shit, and Shannon is choosing to hide her relationship and what is really going on on camera. And gets paid more for it. Oh, great point. Yeah. Great point. Ugh, it, forgot it, about it's the like, money. Yes. Yeah, it's the ultimate – like if you read Not All Diamonds and Rosé and then Brian Moylan's Housewives book, mm -hmm. like you learn that every fight on the show after season one or two is about the show. And yeah. so like I think there is an element of – and I feel like this has happened before on Vanderpump Rules where mm -hmm. it's like we air – how bad our relationships are and how shitty our lives are. And like you are like keeping it together. You're not being honest or whatever, you know, and they do that. 
Beverly Hills, all these, you know, but I think Shannon really wants to make this work. And so making it work means not sharing things on Mm -hmm. camera and Mm -hmm. trying to, but then she slips and she forgets that she told people things off camera, but she did it to other cast members. So they all know it's like, Everyone knows, and and there's then there's rumors. We've all had this where we have one friend in a friend group who has this boyfriend, who you know someone learned something not great about something that happened, and then it's like, ooh, you kind of try and tell the person, but they may not be ready to receive it. So mm-hmm. then you tell your other friends, like, hey, I think so and so, like I don't really like that boyfriend said that they're fat and unattractive that's a really horrible thing and I don't think they should make excuses for it and they're making excuses for it and you know but (laughs) and this is the thing that is different from real life in real life you kind of have to let your friends make mistakes right you have to let them learn on their own and if they want to be in an unstable unhealthy relationship like as long as they're, I don't know, I, it's it's hard. Like, where do you draw the line of what's abusive? Yeah. But, you know, I would not step in in this scenario. I'd be like, this is what she wants. Like, she can have it. Yeah. But on the show, I mm-hmm. think they're mad that she is going through this and she's not sharing it. So then they're forcing it on camera. And I think it's really Emily that's forced most of it. Yes, absolutely. So you have that between Emily, Gina, and Shannon. And then there is this like other thing of where Shannon, sorry, Tamara and Emily have devised this plan that they're going to put the reason why they're all bringing it up on Heather so they don't have to take the fall for bringing Shannon's stuff up. So what they've decided is to say, Heather Dubrow sat down and talked to each one of us about this vault of information that Shannon has opened up to Heather when, as we know, it was at Javier's just a couple of months ago, Shannon. It wasn't in 2020. <laughs> that scene of Shannon dressed as Gina and Emily dressed as Shannon talking about how Shannon <laughs> doesn't remember that she tells people things. It's and then so crazy. And someone else said it to her like, Shannon, you don't remember what you tell people. Yes. Someone other than Emily, I think, said that to her. Yeah, yeah. So they have this – they come up with this plan that we're going to pin it on Heather Dubrow. And Tamara is such – Tamara in all this is the biggest liar because she sat with Emily and said, Emily, I told – you told um, – Emily says, Heather told me that this happened. And then Tamara goes to Shannon and says, "Uh, Emily told me that Heather told her that – she was this all this stuff was going on when Shannon repeats it to Heather and says you went to Emily and Emily went to Tamara Tamara says she says Tamara says that Emily was in tears and she was so upset and she didn't know what to do and I'm like no we watched that whole interaction they were laughing they were there was no tears there was like a full scheming going on it was not that at all and Tamara just makes stuff up and what is amazing is at the end of this Shannon leaves with Tamara and Vicky. And Vicky, as if they are her friends. And I'm like, Shannon, no wonder you are so deeply insecure and so scared and like not able to rely on yourself is because you're surrounded by people who don't actually care about you. Like Tamara is using, Tamara and Vicky are using Shannon to do the Trace Amigas thing. My theory is because they saw how Crappy Lake really spun off. And they want to do their own thing, but they're not going to do it with just Shannon, with just Tamara and Vicky. They need the Trace Amigas because now they're doing appropriation across the country at bars. And so now, like, that is, that's what, but Tamara, Shannon falls for it every single time. She does. And Tamara is like, she's so messy. And then she, she's not doing as good of a job covering herself as I feel like she did in earlier years. So she like comes back to the table and she's like, why am I in it now? Yes. And you're like, oh my God, stop. You're being so obnoxious. You're like lighting something on fire and being like, oh my God, who, why is there a fire burning? Exactly. The scene where Shannon storms off and she tells production, why didn't anybody come and check in on me? And then she says, <laughs> I have – she says, what did she say? Hold on. I'm going to try to find it because I screenshot it. I have normal fights with my boyfriend that paralyze, that paralyze me. me. That is so sad. Is so normal sad. fights don't paralyze you. Yes. Shannon. Yes. 
I think because <laughs> she was married to David for so long that anything that is better than David she thinks is true love. And I don't think she knows what true respect is because I don't know if she fully respects herself. And so she then she can't get that from, from men. And she deserves it because I think she's a great mom. I think she's a smart woman. You know, I – she just is so down on herself and to hear and, you know, she's struggled with her weight a bit since hitting menopause yeah. and yeah, the opposite of Erica Jane yes, that's <laughs> and what happens. Yeah. And part of how she lost weight was actually getting on hormone replacement therapy. She talked about it. She was like, yeah. my estrogen was zero. Yeah, yeah. No shit. No wonder you felt awful. Yeah. You know, so I I just love Shannon. I want the best for her. I feel nervous that her girl, like her youngest girls are going to college. Like what is she going to do on her own if she doesn't have a boyfriend? I worry about how much she drinks sometimes. I oh, think, yeah. you know, particularly with John, it sounds like they both bring out like a lot of drinking in each other. Yes. And I don't know yes. how great that is. But she's fun regardless. Like she's a fun person. I would like to hang out with her. I would find her very funny. I like I'd like to grab yeah, we don't yeah. she doesn't need to be drunk. Like she's fine. There's this like little face that Shannon makes whenever she comes in in costume. She does this like little purse slip slow walk that she does. It's like I'm in on the joke. Like she's just she, you know, she did it when she dressed up like Brett Michaels. Like she's just so yes. funny. And I love it. Um, did you see the minor feud that's happening between Gina and Shannon? I was just about to Instagram. bring this up. <laughs> I felt like Gina is trying so hard to make herself a victim. She, so This hard. is what's gone on. So Gina did an article with David Qu- Dave Quinn in People Magazine before the season came out talking about how she'd been sober for 18 months, that she was using alcohol as a crutch to deal with her divorce, I think. She didn't come out and say it exactly, but the domestic abuse that she experienced and the trauma of that, she was drinking it away. And then she didn't want to to say that she she doesn't feel like she's an alcoholic, but she doesn't feel like alcohol is serving her well. And so she has stopped. And I think she went in with this idea that like my storyline is going to be that I'm I'm done drinking. So all my emotions are coming to the, you know, coming to a head and I'm experiencing them and I'm dealing with it for the first time, which then makes her a sort of a victim, right? We have mm-hmm. to go back and remember what she has been through and she is a victim, right? Yeah. She but is. she – to be a victim of of being made fun of by Shannon, that's where she takes it too far. It's like, no, yeah. you were a victim of your husband. You want to blame everyone but your husband yeah, exactly. for what happened to you. The fact that you're trying to undo some of the penalties that he got – is like, ugh, I don't know. I mean, and then to have so much judgment for Jen with two ends. Oh, God. Who I think is like so lovely. I love her on the show. It's nice Me to too. have someone that has true empathy for people. You yeah. can tell that she really cares about people. And it was so interesting, speaking of all of that, to see her actual and real life friend be think that Ryan is good for her. Yeah. So I think like there's this narrative that Ryan's not good for her. But if her real life friends – think that Ryan is a good match and that the actually the ex-husband wasn't friendly and didn't, you know, do a lot of things with her, then I don't know. Maybe we're buying too much of what Tamara is selling. Yeah. And I think that Tamara thinks that she knows people inside and out and she doesn't. And she thinks that like whatever impression she has of a person, that's it. That's who they are. And there's no way to like cross that. Like she does that with everybody. She does it with Heather. She's always like, oh, Heather looks down on you, blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, yes, Heather can be condescending, but you're pro- you're mostly feeling like Heather looks down on you because you feel inferior to her. Yes. And that is your yes. own insecurity. I've been saying this the whole time. There's, I don't think there's that much wrong with Heather. I don't think think there's that much wrong like if she's smarter it's and you feel like she's smarter and you feel like you're less smart then like I don't know fucking read, read a book, book. <laughs> like <laughs> go learn something right yeah. like stop feeling like it being like it's your problem that you're smart and that you're yeah. educated and that you read and that you pay attention to what's going on in the world like come on yes like is Heather 
unrelatable. Of course, she just went on Instagram and was like, I'm having a chicken finger for the first time. I'm like, Heather, you, you've you eaten chicken fingers before. Stop it. Like, don't be like that. You know what I mean? Is she unrelatable? Because she sold, sold, sold her house for $55 million and then bought a little penthouse that was like bigger than most people's like regular homes. Yes, there is unrelatability across the board on Housewives. But when it comes to being right and not problematic, Heather is usually pretty good compared to the rest of OC. And I think that they really recognize the fact that like they are fumbling dodo birds most of the time and Heather's pretty polished. It's the way that I feel like a lot of the Beverly Hills women felt about like Lisa Vanderpump. Like they always felt like she looked down on them, but like, did she? Maybe. But or like, did she just have an accent? <laughs> or did she just have an accent? Like it's just, and even Heather even said it, I'm this Machiavellian, like, you know, puppet master who's like, <laughs> who knows what like, you know, who's trying to control everybody. She's not. It's the same thing they did to Lisa Vanderpump. Oh, Heather tells us things so that we can, can be convinced to bring it up on camera. You are your own person, Gina and Emily. You could bring it up on camera if you want to. But Heather has not brought up anything of Shannon's on camera. All of you guys did. So Heather's not wrong here. And Shannon is going to come for Heather anyway. And I bet Heather actually spoke to them with concern. Yes. As opposed to the gossip that they spoke with about. Yes. I do think they all do have a level of concern. Yes. Um, and I also think it's like, okay, we've known these things for years and they've never come up and that's annoying. Yes. So like she's not really living her truth. Yeah. And allegedly after the show ended, it turned out that – John and Shannon had been broken up. Like when when we all got the announcement that John and Shannon broke up, apparently they were already broken up before the show was filming. And then he like and, pretended. Is that just a conspiracy pretended. theory though? Like who? I think he said who, it. Oh God. But I don't know if I'm confusing him saying that or if that Steve Lodge guy said that about Vicky. <laughs> I think I think Steve said that about Vicky, and I I do. I don't know. I don't know. Like she was also so hung up on him and so broken up about him. Like she barely like functioned on Ultimate Girls Trip too. But like I'm like, this can't be the first time you've heard this, Vicky. But like she was acting like it was. And so I think Vicky is really empathizing with Shannon because she's like, I've been there where I'm holding on for dear life and you can't make anyone – you know, loosen their grip when they are holding on that tight. So like, let's just be there for her right now rather than make it a whole thing. Also, you know, Vicky hasn't been on the show the last three years, so she hasn't seen Shannon not bring up stuff. Yeah, exactly. And I think that uh, Tamara, Vicky, and Shannon are women who uh, their relationship works best when their own personal lives are in shambles. So they need everybody to be falling apart. Um, Mandy, I – appreciate you for your time. And I know you have a hard stop. So please tell her, thank you for being here. I could talk thank to you. Thank you. Like, you know so we, I could talk to you all afternoon. Okay, you're on vacation next week. Let's figure out in the very soon future, you're going to come back and we're going to spend more time talking because I could talk yes. to you. Yes. Oh my God. I love to do that. Okay. Love, 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 love. Wonderful. Um, Tell everybody where they can find you and what you have going on. So you can find my podcast anywhere you listen to podcasts. It's called Is This Real Life with Mandy Slutsker. If you have difficulty finding it or finding me on social media, you can just type in Mandy with a Y and then slut. And then um, I show up magically because my last name is spelled S-L-U-T-S-K-E-R. And I'm the only Mandy Slutsker in the world according to every possible record that's available. So <laughs> Um, so Mandy's Lucifer is always available as like a username. <laughs> That's nice. <laughs> oh, so yeah, um, that you can find me on Instagram, Twitter. I'm trying to be more, I'm more active on Instagram. I'm trying to be more active on Instagram. I started looking yeah. more on Twitter since it got kind of dark. <laughs> um, yeah. So thank you so much for having me. Oh, my God. No, it was amazing. I'll be back later on this week. Thank you for being here, Mandy. I'll be back later uh, next week talking about all the things that are going on in the world. Um, That's it. Say bye.